The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. And uh, joining us, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, John Kerner. Um, a, a lot of a lot of inf- information to cover here. Um, how are you doing tonight, John? I'm doing great. Great. How are you doing tonight? Ah, uh, pretty pretty good, pretty good. Uh, thank you for joining me. And uh, um, so let's start. Let's just for the people that don't know you or haven't heard of you, and um, let's start with who you are and kind of a little bit of your background. Well, I teach U.S. history in near Buffalo, New York, at Erie Community College. And I've written a number of books about the paranormal. My latest one is Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, The Secret Drug Trade in Laos. And that's more books about the paranormal, too. And I also have a company that I do ghost walks with. It's called ParanormalWalks.com. And that's a company that does walks in the Buffalo area. And it's based off the research that I've conducted. And we do those in Hamburg and, and, and in Lockport. And this latest book is um, available at Amazon.com and also at Barnes & Noble. It's available for Nook and for Kindle downloading. And uh, I think what makes it unique is a couple different things. Uh, one is that it's a concise book, uh, about 100 pages, and it presents a unique perspective on the assassinations of, of Malcolm X and then President Kennedy. Hmm. So what, what brought you into that Um into that area because you're doing paranormal and then now you're into the uh, the JFK and Malcolm X. What like what was the thing that led you there? Well, a couple of different things. Uh, the um, kind of the nuts and bolts in the book comes from my master's thesis uh, when I was did, I did my master's work at SUNY Brockport, and um, it was about the JFK administration's policy toward Laos. And I spent, you know, several months looking into that, and I just became shocked to find out when I was doing research for that that the CIA was deeply involved in the drug trade in Southeast Asia, especially in Laos. And the president was was just spreading them tooth and nail, trying to stop the drug trade and to keep peace in, in Laos and in Vietnam. And my thesis is that that's why they assassinated him and also Malcolm X. And also in the book Robert Kennedy and, and Dr. King as well. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. So, do you, do you cover the area of of, of Lee Harvey Oswald? Like, uh, how, do you think he was the person that shot Kennedy, or was he um, part of it, or just a uh, patsy? It seems like, from my perspective, he probably was a, a patsy, which I guess he could probably say by his own admission he says he was, and. If you look at some of the evidence behind this, I think one interesting way to, to point to the evidence is from a man named E. Howard Hunt. Hunt was an agent in the CIA from almost the very beginning. And at the end of his life, um, he gave a, uh, a deathbed confession to his son. And in that confession, he talks about the extensive plot to kill President Kennedy. And he names a number of different names, including himself. And a lot of this stuff has checked out since he's made this confession. And a number of different, other different people that were interested in keeping uh, the drug trade going were involved in the assassination to kill President Kennedy and Clay, a man named David Morales, and a number of other men, too. So it seems like, from the evidence that's been put forward, uh, that's kind of where it comes from. And my book is not so much about, about who killed President Kennedy. It's more about sort of why he was killed, you know, the motive to keep the drug trade going in Southeast Asia because there was so much money to be made off of that. So, so you're thinking of following the money here. You're, so you're thinking specifically right. that it was about the money that the drug trade was making. So then you're sort of stating that the CIA was the ones that were running it and collecting the money? Right. Um, in fact, since the book has come out, I've had a number of different men contact me and they've talked about how they were involved in it directly, and they're, in fact, in some ways thankful that the truth is now coming out, and they've known for a number of years that this was happening. Some work has been done already about this. Um, Gary Webb, for example, he was writing about how the agency was involved in the drug trade in, in South America, and in fact, there's a film about him now called Kill the Messenger, and he died mysteriously uh, back in 2004. 
Um, another man named Louis Lomax was writing about this back in the 1960s. He was a TV reporter, too. And he also died mysteriously in 1970. So there has been some writing about this, some discussion. Mm. But those who've talked about this have um, paid an enormous price in some cases. Well, this might be a bad month for me because <laughs> 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 I've got I've got uh, I I've done Judith Baker and uh, I got Roger Stone and, mm-hmm. and Philip John. I've got like a lot of people. There's going to be a whole month on this, so uh, I might not make February. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps I might be joining you. <laughs> yeah, kind of laugh now, but maybe it's. <laughs> Not so funny then. So and so, has it shaken you a little? Has it, it given you any issues personally since it's been? I'm well, yeah, and I could just talk a bit about that. Um, I mean, I'm here to be honest about all this. Uh, I, mean, I have a very patriotic family. My my mother and father are very patriotic. My father served in the military as my grandfather. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I could just talk a bit about a personal thing that happened to me last summer that has not really been explained very well to me. Um, Last summer, the book went into production, and right when that happened, I was struck with a horrible illness. I was in perfect health. I weighed about 190 pounds, um, was working out every day, playing tennis, doing the normal things I usually do, and then I just got hit by this illness, and I lost about 40 pounds. Um, it just ravaged my body. I had to get my throat cut into three times. My back was cut into. I still have the scars on my throat and my back. Uh, the doctor said I, I probably should have died. And the strangest thing about this, they said that they asked me a number of different times. Different people said, have you gone to Southeast Asia ever? And I said, no, and I've never been there. They said, well, the, the illness that you have is only unique to Southeast Asia. It only shows up there. Has never once shown up ever in the United States. So it seems like you're deliberately poisoned for some reason. So they said we can't explain why this happened, but you got poisoned somehow, and you probably should be dead. Wow. So that's um, kind of shaking you a little bit. It did, yeah. As you can tell, I'm just kind of now recovering my voice. It's been a a long struggle. Uh, I've, I've gained back about 15 pounds. And that uh, just now kind of coming out of it. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, that's a. Well, it's got to got to change you. I, I I I sort of think the last while I've been doing a lot of uh, these reports on this. You know about even right through to Hitler and escaping the bunker and and all these yeah. things and it sure um, stuff I would always put toward conspiracy theory and kind of brush it off probably twenty years ago, uh, but now it. I tend to take it more serious, <laughs> and it's kind of disheartening in a way. Yeah, you know what? Um, it is disheartening, but I can maybe make two points about that. Um, one thing, one is kind of a hopeful point, and one is kind of more a logical point. Um, I do teach history, and I see a lot of my students, they seem to be much more open to conspiracies, and, and when I talk about these assassinations with them, and I've been teaching now for about 10 years, and I teach both halves of the U.S. history, this is the thing they care about the most. This is the thing they pay attention to the most. This is the thing they want to hear about the most. They understand that it it affects our our current events in so many ways. And the death of these four men just ravages our nation's history. And and we've talked about that a little bit, too. But um, the other thing is, I don't think conspiracy should be thought to be all that unusual, as you were saying. I mean, it seems like they're more common. And, you know, what are they? All they really are is people working together in a group. And we do that in history. We tend to work in groups. So why is that unusual? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's quite common, and I think it should be more about conspiracy fact than what they call theory. Right. You know, because what 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 we're doing is we're just talking about things that have happened, um, not really saying this is the outcome. We're not coming to the conclusion. It's just about hey, there's something more here. Yeah. You know. Um, I, I think it also. I don't know about you, but I think. Um, in history, it's rattled people more, it shakes the foundation. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people that, that teach history and people in the, in the mainstream media, they have a certain mindset. Um, they don't want to think about ideas that maybe would be um, less complementary towards our country. 
so we maybe would cover up some of the unpleasant things about our nation's history because of that. They didn't want to know the truth because it's too frightening. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, it always comes out, but doesn't it? Eventually it does, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to cover it up. Eventually someone is going to talk about it, and there'll be people that, that, that want to know about it, too. Yeah. And now, now, are the files still sealed for JFK? A number of them are, yeah. I mean, let's just mention David Morales for a minute and talk about him. There are 61 files sealed for him. And E. Howard Hunt, he said that this guy was directly involved to assassinate President Kennedy. And he even admitted this to many of his friends that he was there in Dallas. Secondly, Morales was also at the scene of Howard Kay's assassination, too, at the Ambassador Hotel Ballroom. He was there, too. In fact, he admits that as well. He was there to kill Robert Kennedy. So this is one man of many whose files are sealed. And there are many others, too. I mean, it's not just them. There are other files sealed. Uh, e. Howard Hunt, too. And the Obama administration should be... You know, I think they should be held accountable for this. They should release any files that are still there. And there, again, there are a number of them that have yet to be leaked um, to the public. Well, why do you think that is, Bud? I mean, I, I, I have to think that, you know, even the administration now, but even if we have another one and the ones in the past, nobody's really tried to release this. Is there something they're really hiding you know, there's probably a lot of things in there that would implicate these people directly in the assassination. I mean, I put in my book that, again, just talking about the men who E. Howard Hunt names to assassinate President Kennedy, there are 123 pages of files on William K. Harvey that have yet to be released, 606 files on David, Lee, David Atlee Phillips, we have 332 pages of files on Howard Hunt that I haven't released yet. And I mentioned there's also 61 files on uh, David Morales, and which makes this even more, I think, um, disgraceful, is that back in 1976, the House Select Committee on Assassinations demanded that the agency release everything that they've got, and they refused to do so. So it, it's... It's been tried many times, but they just have these black budgets and so much power in the country that they just have refused to, to do it. And even the ones that they do release, they get redacted. <laughs> Someone goes through <laughs> with the felt pen anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, uh, so w now bring us back to that. So what was, um, okay, so, so Kennedy's our first one, JFK. Yeah. Um, what was the uh, reasoning? Is it just, because uh, I mean, um, you're sort of saying the CIA is behind this. So is it just that they were running drugs? Well, let's just put this in some perspective. Um, there's so much money that they made in the drug trade. Uh, just just one example alone. Uh, in, in, there was this one, one week in November 1963, the president was killed. The agency shipped 1,146 kilos of opium to South Vietnam and that netted them a profit of $97,000 just for that one shipment. So that, that's just one shipment one month in one year. So enormous amounts of cash is, is available to them to be made. So Laos is called the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia. And as long as they can justify fighting communism in that country, they can stay there. And one key thing to this is Vietnam. Vietnam, to them, is a big marketplace for heroin to sell to the men fighting the war in Vietnam. So as long as they can keep the war going there, as long as possible, they can keep the growing, selling, and trading drugs. And many men have emailed me since the book has come out, and they've said, yes, we have actually bought heroin from agents of the CIA. And many of them needed the heroin because the combat, of course, you know, was so stressful for these men. This was a way for stress relief. And many of them, talking about hundreds of thousands of them, came home addicted to heroin, and we know that 60,000 have killed themselves since the Vietnam War ended. So it's, it's really all tied in. Hmm. Yeah, it's just all sort of... And so what was the, what was the mood of the people uh, in general about Kennedy? Well, we have a number of people that just don't like him. I mean, oh. you start off with the 1960 campaign for president, and you get resistance because of his Catholicism, and then you move on to his administration. 
and there are those that resist his civil war power, I should have said civil war, civil rights record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, then you get forward even further from there, and there's resistance from the military and the CIA. He refuses to go to war in Cuba, Laos, and in Vietnam. And those that want war to fight communism and to keep the drugs going are just bitterly opposed to him. And I put in the book that one thing that the agency does that is just really diabolical to get back at him for his anti, uh, for, I should say, for his, you know, for his peace policies, is that they try to destroy the Peace Corps. The agency attempts to destroy the Peace Corps by pretending <clears throat> that <clears throat> they are college students and, you know, not agents in the CIA. So they're trying to use JFK's Peace Corps for war. And, I mean, if you look at how diabolical this is, it's almost like trying to kill Mr. Rogers. I mean, how bad can you get? <laughs> so you have things like that going on behind the scenes, and things are getting really tense. In fact, if you go to the, the Peace Corps' website, it's, it says, if you've ever been in the CIA, you can't even bother joining the Peace Corps. Just don't even bother applying. Hmm. And, and, and uh, so... Now, the, he, he also had problems with the CIA, too, didn't he? Didn't he, like, have um, fire some of the people? And Yes. Um, just we can go into that a little bit. Um, we can start with the, you know, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Oh, yeah. The attempt to remove uh, Fidel Castro, which goes horribly wrong. So the agency tells him <clears throat> that if we send in these, these 1,500 men to Cuba... We'll get rid of Castro. Well, it doesn't work. The invasion completely fails, and then get, they get captured, tortured, and killed. But during the invasion, um, the CIA tells Kennedy, why don't you bomb Cuba or invade Cuba? And he says, we're not going to do that. They pose no threat to us. I would start a third world war with Russia. I couldn't do that. So yeah, from that point forward, they start to split. They think he's stopped on communism, and he thinks that they're held on in war. So he, as he said, he fires Alan Dulles, the director, he fires Richard Bissell, the director of operations, he fires Cappell, another man in the agency. So these different events uh, in a, are kind of like house-cleaning events. And then the following summer, uh, this is 61, he signs, he signs NSAM 51, 52, and 53, which basically move the agency's corporate operations to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, taking away almost all their power. And that begins his effort to, as he says, break them into a thousand pieces. Hmm. So where, where was that heading then? Like what was the... the, the so in, in general, there's a lot of people that just liked him in, in, in popular, like just the population, just the regular population. Yes, he did have, um, when we go to the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis happens, um, and he solves that peacefully, uh, again, it's October of 62. And from that point forward, let's get to 1963, he's, he's enjoying enormous levels of popularity. Uh, there is a, a mock-up poll in the spring of 63, that pits him against Barry Goldwater in a potential election for 1964, and he just has, he just trounces him in a potential knockout poll. So the public likes him by and large, but again, there are segments that don't like him, like in the South, especially in the South, and in the military. So it's pretty clear there's going to be four more years of JFK, and that's just not acceptable if you're in the agency or in the military because of his consistent efforts at peace in, in Southeast Asia. And he does set out to withdraw from the Vietnam War. He wants to have that done by 1965. And, again, that would be anathema to the agency's efforts to and promote drugs into Southeast Asia and sell them to the to the soldiers fighting in Vietnam. And, and so there was also rumors that he wasn't going to have Lyndon Johnson run as his vice president in the second term. Yeah, that was another possibility. Uh, in fact, Richard Nixon says that, um, ironically enough, in Dallas, um, the day before the assassination, he suggests that they're not going to have Lyndon Johnson on the ticket. 
And in fact, the president had said that privately to some people, too, that he was thinking about changing Johnson. And in fact, E. Howard Hunt mentioned that Johnson was directly involved in and had knowledge of the conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. So if he was thinking of removing him, that, of course, gives him more motive to be involved with this whole operation. Yeah. Now, your book covers more than um, JFK. Uh, you've gotten into um, Malcolm X as well. So how how do you figure he's involved, and how, how would the same agency want to kill both of them? Because they seem kind of the same but different, you know what I'm I'm getting at like uh, you think of JFK as having the power. He's the president. He's got a, he's got power to affect them. How did uh, Malcolm X affect them so that they wanted to kill him? Well, once we get to 1964, 1965, Malcolm X is increasing in his influence, not just in our country but in Africa too. He makes a number of different visits to Africa, and he's trying to build an African African American unity. And he feels there, there's a lot of empathy that exists between the plight of both of both these different people. They're so similar in, in so many ways. So he, he has this influence that's growing all throughout the world. And he is preaching a message of anti-drugs and anti-war. He is an early opponent of the Vietnam War. He comes out against the war in the 1950s even. He sees it as evil. And we're talking about, you know, protesting happening in our country in the late 60s. So he's way ahead of the curve on that. And secondly, he is speaking very effectively because he knows firsthand how bad drugs are because he used them himself, that drugs like heroin and many others are just ruining America's ghettos and many black people. And he calls it the white man's poison. So in many different speeches he says that our country needs to move away from drugs and away from war. So these two things, of course, are all about what the agency stands for, drugs and war. So this man is dead set against both of these things. And again, we're coming up on 50 years for its assassination this coming February, so it's coming up pretty soon. But even before they actually killed him, they tried to kill him two other times before. They tried to poison him in um, the summer before he died in Cairo. <clears throat> and that didn't work. He survived it. And I guess it was a few months before that he had um, had his house bombed by the agency. And about a month before he died, they tried to kill him in France. So it happened a few different times before they actually got to him in February of 65. Wow. Uh, much more serious than just writing a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, they were, and and when they killed him, it was kind of an overkill, wasn't it? Wasn't it like twenty one shots in him? And or... yeah, it was just a barrage of gunfire. I mean, it's just so disrespectful to him and his family. His his wife was there with all the children, and then they witnessed the assassination firsthand, and it scarred them for life, obviously. And the assassins to this very day have been have been not found. Uh, there were three men that were held accountable, but his likely they were not even involved with the assassination. So most of the assassins that shot at him that day had never been located. So, again, like you were saying, it was just just an execution of this man in public in February of 65. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's really devastating. To and I just have so much respect for him. I mean, he's so misunderstood. I mean, this man, I mean, he starts off as a drug dealer and a pimp, but he's able to change. He knows that, you know, we can evolve as people, Obviously, there is some racism to him early on, but he understands when he goes to Mecca that white people, whites are not all evil, that white people can be trusted and respected just as black people can be. And he starts also to think of, to build a coalition with Dr. King. And their common ground is anti-drug, anti-war messages. And he was getting pretty close to doing that at the end of his life, which makes him even more of a threat. Hmm. And and so now, Dr. King. Now, do you, do you put him in there as well? Do you think the CIA was behind that as well, or? Absolutely. Um, there's a book um, called Execution of State by William Pepper that talks a lot about this. It really proves that the agency was behind it. But the part that interests me the most, though, more connects to my thesis, is well, we can mention a guy named Doug Valentine. He wrote a book in 1990 where he talked about how. 
the assassins for Dr. King's assassination were from something called Operation Phoenix. And Operation Phoenix was used by the CIA to basically keep the Vietnam War going as long as possible and to keep the drug trade going as long as possible. And one man in that Operation Phoenix was David Morales, who mentioned before was pinned by Hunt as one of JFK's assassins, part of the conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. So Doug Valentine says in 1990 that the assassins for King came from Operation Phoenix, again, which is part of the program that is in Southeast Asia pushing drugs in the people of Vietnam. And again, that comes directly from the drug trade. So we can get, we can get, connect the King assassination there, too. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I always go through this, you know, I'm, there's so much to think about. <laughs> Yeah, I always, as I'm going through it in this subject, there's just so many, so many areas to go in, and there's so much, and it is kind of, it is disheartening. It is kind of, um, sometimes it, you get caught up in in emotion more than, and you start getting sidetracked. But um, so, so those two and uh, those three, and now, and you also put in that RFK. Right. Now, was that is that just more because he would continue um, what uh, John wanted to do, or maybe he would expose them, shut down the CIA, kind of? You're right on both points. So let's just talk about him a little bit. Now, with um, with Robert Kennedy, I mean, just got to feel so bad. I mean, he he is so devastated by his brother's death. He even starts to wear his brother's clothing to feel closer to him. Um, he even goes to the cemetery where his brother is buried, and he sleeps there sometimes overnight next to the eternal flame. I mean, he's, he's that devastated by the, the death of his brother. Wow, I didn't so, realize that, actually. Yeah, it, this came out years later. He, he actually would bribe the, the guards at the, at, uh, at the cemetery there, Arlington National Cemetery, to say, just let me in for the night. I want to... He would bring his sleeping bag, and he'd just sleep next to his brother's grave. And, again, he's just so devastated by the death of his brother, all of the hopes and dreams that they had. They were just best friends. But the day of the assassination, he goes to the agency's director, John McCone. He, he tells him, I know you did this, and I'm going to prove it. So he spends the next several years to try to prove that the agency killed his brother. And he kind of comes to the conclusion that they have. And one thing he wants to do is if he becomes president, he wants to expose the truth of the assassination and bring those that did this to trial and execute them for treason and also dismantle the agency. So, I mean, if he becomes president, that is the end of the CIA. I mean, that is a, a huge threat to their existence. And could you imagine at that point what would happen? I mean, there would be so much different things in our country's history. Yeah. Without that agency meddling into Africa and, and, and the Middle East, would there be a war on terrorism today? Would there be such hatred for our country? Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. That's that's definitely. So, how do you think all of this has affected the world today? How would you compare that? Is if this if one or all of them have lived? I mean, I think. Um, I mean, all four of these men were just such effective advocates for the working class. I mean, right now we have this huge gap between the rich and the poor, whether it's, you know, good or bad is debatable, but it, it exists. And if you're in the working class, you know that you've been struggling for a long time with low wages. So, I mean, these men, they were advocates for those people that are struggling today. And they would have most likely lived to the late 1990s if they had to live out their lives properly. And we do know that uh, Dr. King was about to start what he was going to call the, the poor people's movement. And this poor people's campaign was going to bring power to the working class. And that was going to start in 1969. And that would have been the first year of RFK's administration. And, of course, he would be very open to accepting the potential for this, to expand it and to promote it. So without RFK's presidency and, you know, without King's poor people's campaign, you can't have that, that trend forward that's towards the working class and not towards the wealthy. 
and that's a huge impact on why things went differently for the working class in this in the 70s and 80s and not and, and again and, and towards the wealthy and not towards the working class without those men around it really changes a lot that could have happened we then don't if they, if they live their lives there's no watergate and they're the forum that got killed at Kent State would most likely be sharing their how they did it with their families this year. I mean, it, just so many different things would have gone better. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it, it seemed like nobody really stepped in their place either. No, it wasn't the big backing. Yeah, I mean, it, it just the leadership in the Democratic Party in the nineteen seventies is just there's there isn't really the, the party just turns in. Uh, like George McGovern, I mean, he's not really a man who could uh, garner a lot of public support. So it just made, made him lose a lot of support. The leadership has is, is been decimated. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't know how. I, I, I'm too young to know how I would feel about the parties back then. But it seems now, um, I don't know if I really trust anybody that's in a party period. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, and and I really don't like the way everything's socialized. Everything's got to be either Democrat or Republican, and we don't really talk about the like the person, or they don't. You know what I mean? It isn't like they just come out and talk about what they think and believe and follow that. It's all about party lines, and it just seems to be working for corporations. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of things change when these sport men are not allowed to play out the rest of their lives as they should be allowed to. I mean, what this Senate ends up doing, um, it almost is it is it overturns the will of the people. I mean, we have democracies, and we shouldn't be having assassinations. That should be other countries doing those sorts of horrible things. If you want to change things, vote. You know, don't conspire to kill people. That's from my perspective, anyway. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's, that's the only way we kind of grow. That's the whole idea, is living with each other we might have different ideas, but we can support each other, you know. Yes. I uh, just, um, yeah. And that, because I, I find that even goes on now. All the stuff that's been happening now and lately, it just reminds me it's the same sort of thing. Um, pitting. It's not, you know, people aren't stopping and really listening. Yeah, and I think um, one thing that's different now is there's so many different outlets you can find your specific perspective of if it's very radical and you can just give yourself fed that information over and over again and your mindset just stays that way and you don't have any new information to come in and maybe perhaps change your perspective. Yeah. But then you know, that's not growth. if you if you come to an assessment or you come to a conclusion about something, you no longer think about it to really develop it, right? So right. it's kind of the wrong way to do it, but Again, that's just my opinion. I think that <laughs> we've got to constantly be questioning and, and seeking out more and more information, not just put conclusions and then move on. It's just sort of... But and maybe a, a related point to that, kind of in a way, is <laughs> <clears throat> as an historian, I, I feel almost obligated to be able to convey information to people from my perspective in an effective way That's that's... Kind of, uh, I don't want to say simplistic, but it's condensed enough where it can be processed easily. My book is 100 pages long, and I think that's about the extent in the modern era people can read. It. <laughs> I mean, we, we, I, don't, I don't think we can be expected to read 600 and 700 page history books anymore. We don't have the time for this stuff. Yeah. So I feel like if I get 100 pages in, get my point across, and I think it's, I think I made my made my case. Maybe you know. I, Perhaps it's a, a reflection of, of my um, upbringing, but um, I think you know, you get your point across simply, effectively. It's the best way to go, and I think that makes this book effective. In fact, I just want to mention it, it is available for less than ten bucks for a Kindle and Nook downloading. So it's a, it's an easy read, quick, easy read. If you want to get access to it, it's on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. Yeah, I, I suggest it's an excellent read. And uh, so I also wanted to. So, what do you think about Lyndon Johnson's role in this? Um, is it any further? Was he involved? Do you think? Yeah, I think that again, it's obvious in some ways that 
Johnson has a very clear motive to do this. And we can go back to the drug trade, too. The agency is, it knows very well that Johnson is much more in favor of, again, promoting and, and expanding, in fact, the, the CIA's access to drugs in Southeast Asia. And they will get that from him directly when he becomes president. So there certainly is motive there for him, and the evidence exists that they were, they were talking to him before the assassination. They were giving him intelligence before the assassination. They were letting him know what's happening in Southeast Asia. He was asking for information. They were giving it to him. So they knew his perspective even before the assassination takes place. Hmm. And we also know that the day they bury President Kennedy, the day after they bury President Kennedy, uh, Johnson signs National uh, Security Action Memorandum, NSAM 273, which reverses JFK's withdrawal policy and expands the agency's covert operations in Southeast Asia. And again, it's one day after JFK was buried. So they get directly from the president what they wanted. Again, more access to the drug trade and in more, um, and an expanded Vietnam War. Hmm. No. Yeah. yeah, we'll keep going. Sorry. Well, one more thing I can mention, too. Um, you know, people might wonder, well, why would Laos be so important for the agency? Well, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff was recommending to President Kennedy we need to fight the war in, in Southeast Asia. We need to fight the war in Laos. We need to win the war in communism there. And to do this, they needed to, they said, you need to commit 60,000 ground troops to win the war in, in Laos and Southeast Asia. And JFK says, well, you, we can't win there. Our military is, is unequipped to fight in, in jungles and tunnels. We fight land battles. We'll be bogged down there for years. It will never work. And he is proven right, obviously. The war was never won those reasons. So the president sees this, and he has the vision to know that that kind of a war would never be won. But the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the agency, just, just pushes him and even tries to trick him to go into war, because they know that if he goes to war, that means 60,000 ground troops in Laos, which means 60,000 more customers to sell heroin to. And, again, we can explain a couple of things if you want about how they try to trick him, because it's pretty unusual in some ways. Oh, yeah, go for it, for sure. Well, one thing that happens is once we get to 1962, the president feels that he wants to try to get peace in Laos between the communists and anti-communists to stop the drug trade and, and to stop the war. And he gets the job done. He gets a peace settlement in Laos with help of Premier Khrushchev of Russia. And it's a great big victory for him and his administration, the summer of 62. If this is going to work, there's got to be men in, in that new government that he's going to have to trust in Laos, men that are not, you know, communists. They're progressively minded people that don't want drugs. And he gets them in place, and then within just a few months, the agency assassinates them and other men that support that new government. So that's one big step forward for war when they kill these men that, that supported JFK in Laos. Another thing we can mention, too, um, as long as war continues in Laos, the agency can keep justifying staying there in the Congress with their black budgets. So if ever anything happens that would tip the balance either way, they try to tip it the other way. So say, for example, the war is going for the communists, then they'll hurt the other side to keep the war going the other way, just to extend the war as long as possible. And there's an army there called the, the Royal Laotian Army that's, of course, anti-communist that we supported back then. And the agency at one point in time tried to destroy that army to trick JFK into, into sending ground troops into Southeast Asia. They felt that if they had destroyed that army, they could trick him into going to war, like with the Bay Pigs invasion. But in both cases, he said, no, we're still not going to go to war. We're still going to resist invading Laos, even though they tried to trick him in both those countries. Hmm. That's, uh, did he not know that there was um, this going on? I mean, he knew. I mean, obviously, but did he, did he not feel threatened, do you think? 
Well, I think, again, initially, in his early administration months, months of his administration, he is trying to figure out you know, what's going on in Vietnam, what's going on in Laos, what's going on in Cuba, and he's trying to figure out who he can trust. And initially, he, I think, can only, can only trust the Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and his brother, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General. Just McNamara and RFK are just up in that he can put his faith in. Everybody else seems kind of hell-bent on war. And as he goes forward, he tries to figure out ways to keep himself out of war in different areas. And it's difficult in many cases to avoid the pressure to go to war. The Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, is a, is a key example of this, where he, behind the scenes, negotiates this deal to withdraw the missiles for a pledge not to invade Cuba. And that solves the crisis peacefully. But even though that happens, the Joint Chiefs of Staff still wants to go to war in Cuba. They still want Castro gone. You might know something called Operation Northwoods. No. Okay, well, this is um, it's, it's basically the plan was the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the CIA, they wanted and Castro gone in Cuba. So what they're going what they're going to do is they they proposed to President Kennedy, why don't we go up an American passenger jet with US citizens on board, we'll explode a US Navy ship with US sailors on board. We'll start some riots in Miami, kill some people there and do all these acts of terrorism that will kill Americans and blame all that on Castro. And that would would trick the public into going to war. And the president shut down that program in March of 1963, which angered the Joint Chiefs of Staff enormously, and the agency, too. What what was their... Why were they so um, bent on getting Castro? Well, they felt that it was an embarrassment that he was still there, this communist off the coast of Florida, that they were successful in putting leaders in Iran and Guatemala. So this was a big embarrassment that they couldn't get the job done with the Bay Pigs invasion. And they felt that if JFK invaded Cuba during the Bay Pigs invasion or during the missile crisis, they would have got him gone. They had the consequences, though. I mean, if they did that, I mean, that would have caused World War III. The Russians would have counterattacked, perhaps, in West Berlin. And the stakes here, of course, were for high because they're nuclear arms for both countries. So the, and the president knows this. He's aware of the consequences, but the Joint Chiefs of Staff doesn't care. It's a matter of pride with them, a mindset of, you know, all guns are blazing, they have the consequences. Hmm. Wow, it's real, uh, <laughs> it's real disturbing, eh? Uh, who, now, when you went um, through all this stuff, where where did you research? Like, did, was there any any books or movies or anything that you've put together that you've seen that uh, you thought was pretty worthwhile seeing? Yeah, what, what I, my research comes from a number of different areas. Uh, the the most revealing that I have is they come from the, the JFK Library in Boston. Uh, that library is an enormous resource. And the president recorded a number of his conversations with his cabinet secretly and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I requested anything that they had when they discussed Laos or Vietnam. So they, they mailed me these cassette tapes that I listened to hour after hour, and just for months and, and, and days and you know, weeks at a time, I was listening to this stuff pouring through the administration's policy toward Laos and Vietnam, and that's where the nuts and, nuts and bolts of the book come from the discussions of the president with his cabinet. Hmm. And do you think anybody else has uh, really kind of got this story right out there? The only one that, that got close to this was Alfred McCoy, and he did a number of work, again, about the drug trade in Southeast Asia, and he, re- he wrote a book about that that came out in the 70s. But that book doesn't connect the assassinations to the drug trade. He just lays out how it operated, you know, how the agency used Air America for their transportation routes 
uh, you know, how the opium got produced, where it got produced, uh, you know, who was, who was involved. My book makes the connections between the assassinations and the drug trade. So he lays out how it worked. I lay out, you know, why it happened. Hmm. And I could point one, one more thing out, too, that they're kind of getting more of this stuff. We talked about, you know, Robert Kennedy and, and Dr. King. Uh, January of 1968 is a key month for all this this whole story, really. Uh, that year is is kind of like it's a changing year for the agency. They, they want to move a lot of the access to drugs into the United States more. They want to expand the domestic drug market. They had done so before, but they want more of, of, of more access to it. So that month, uh, the agency arranges a meeting. In fact, David Morales did this. Morales was one of the men involved. He arranges a meeting between Santos, Traficante, and Vang Pao. This happened in Vietnam. And the purpose of the meeting was, again, to plan how they could expand the drug trade into the United States, into the Western Hemisphere. And, of course, just a few months later, the agency assassinates uh, Dr. King and, and also Robert Kennedy as part of the plan to expand the drug trade. And one of the things that they would do, and in fact, I just got an email about this a couple days ago, just diabolical stuff. I mean, they would use the coffins of the dead soldiers from Vietnam as a way to ship the drugs from Southeast Asia to the United States. Wow. <laughs> it's just a shocking stuff. Yeah. They just, they, in some cases, even one man said he, he saw one time where they actually cut open the body and they would suck the, the bags of heroin or opium, whatever it is, uh, into the body, the body cavities, as a way to get the most access and just fill up as much as they possibly can in the box and just ship it all to the United States. And so did they organize it all themselves, as in, so they get it, they ship it to the U.S., so they must have a way of getting it in without customs knowing, because it's CIA. And did they distribute it as well throughout the states, or did they just give it to drug dealers and let them do it, do you think? I think it's a bit of both. Um, and, and, and back in uh, Vietnam and, and in Southeast Asia and Laos, they had the help of the Hmong people. Uh, those are called the Mao. Uh, and they know how to grow the drugs. Uh, they've done it for years. They smoke it. They know how to, you know, convert it to heroin. And, you know, once the CIA goes in there in the 1950s, they're first put there to fight communism. That's what their first purpose is from the Eisenhower administration. But then they find out that they've got the golden ticket. I mean, they see, you know, how lucrative this is. And then the, the among people, they, they start showing them how to grow the drugs and how to properly, you know, use it and that kind of thing, and it takes off from there. Really, um, the public was paying for their drug dealing. <laughs> no, isn't that horrible? I mean, because, you I, know, they're, yeah. they're paying their salary, basically. I mean, that's probably nothing compared to what they made off the drugs, but in, yeah. in essence, they're, they're using their man hours that they're paid for by the country to run this drug operation. And, and just devastating effects. I mean, we have the men to this very day, the, the Vietnam War veterans. I just feel so bad for them. My heart goes out to them. I and mean, they just are still struggling with drug addiction. And, and it's not just them. I mean, the access to heroin in this country really comes from that agency. And that's where not really the gestation is, is from their access to it that begins in the 50s. And again, the ripple effects of that is so much. I mean, even the monetary effects, too. I, I calculate in the book that Vietnam War cost one trillion dollars the country, one trillion dollars, and you could solve poverty with that kind of money. I mean, you could end poverty with the one trillion dollars. So mm. there's so much effects from this this whole story in so many different directions. Yeah, but it's back to all about the money, right? Yeah, it's all the money, I and mean, it's really what it is. And and, and if you just look at that aspect to it, I think you can understand why Malcolm X, John F. Kennedy, his brother, and Dr. King, when they start saying that the Vietnam War needs to come to an end and the drug trade has to stop too, then 
the, the crosshairs start happening on their on their heads. You know. Yeah. Do you think the future, like the the uh, leadership that followed? So Johnson obviously had a big involvement, but um, after that, do you think Nixon himself had an involvement as well? Yes, I put in my book um, that Nixon. This came out just years later. In fact, came out uh, last year that in 1968. Um, President Johnson, when he decides to withdraw from the campaign for president, he starts to negotiate peace with South Vietnam. He wants to end the war. He does this because he thinks it will help Hubert Humphrey become president and they'll get elected president. Humphrey gets a nomination in the summer of 68. So if, it, if he starts peace negotiations, it might make a Democrat become president four more years. Well, Richard Nixon finds out about this and he does a number of different things behind the scenes to sabotage the peace process, to keep the war going. And I talk about this in my book, that Johnson calls this treason, that Nixon should not, got, should not have gotten involved. And a reporter named Beverly Deep, she reported to the Christian Science Monitor that she discovered that Nixon was doing this, that he was trying to sabotage the peace process. He was telling the people... Uh, in Vietnam that and other agencies like the CIA that he wants to keep the war going and he will do so if, if he becomes president so even before he becomes president he makes it clear that he will expand the war which he does in fact when he invades Cambodia and Laos now the, the war wasn't very successful was it I mean on a fighting front no I mean it was uh, in some ways kind of pathetic I mean just the war in, in Laos for example um I think we should give Kennedy a lot of credit here. I mean, he, he knows that the war in Laos and Vietnam, it, it, it's not going to be won. It's a war we should not waste our time with. He tells the Joint Chiefs of Staff, if they're not going to go to war in Cuba, which is so close, why should we go to war in Vietnam and Laos, which is which is just so far away? It doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, and especially if we can't win it and we're, we're spending the money, the resources, all the lives that are that are being killed and and, and tortured and hurt. Yeah, and, and 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 the other thing is, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the agency, they were saying, well, we need to win the war in Vietnam, and we need to invade Laos, because Laos is being used to run supplies from North Vietnam to South Vietnam through the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. So if we cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we can win the Vietnam War. Well, JFK says it's not that simple. It, it's not like it's a paved road. We can put a roadblock on. I mean, it, it's... It's a series of different trails. Uh, they go through tunnels and, and mountains and swamps and different terrain. It, 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 it'd be impossible to do that. And not only that, he said, "Well, let's look at let's look at Laos. You know, we have an army there, the anti-communist army, the Royal Laotian Army. Is it even worth backing them? Uh, this army, he says, we can't trust them. There are some cases he found out where they leave battle." Leave the battlefront to go pick flowers. Another, another time, we found out they left the battlefront to go swimming. <laughs> they, they have no interest in the fighting. <laughs> another time, too, um, they even left the battlefront to go to a festival with the enemy. They, they both sides said, "Let's just stop fighting, and we'll go to the festival and have some fun at a local carnival." So it, it's just strange that they even they, he says they didn't bother backing these people. They didn't want to fight. He even found out that they did a, a study of the people of Laos, and he found out that most people in Laos felt that the earth was flat, and they also thought that they were the only people on the earth, just them. So they are not very intelligent people. They were educated. So he said, you know, to, to bet all we have on them, to, to, to work with them, to try to trust them, it just doesn't really make much sense. And there's no ports there to, to stage an invasion. Uh, there's no telecommunications. I mean, it would be a complete disaster. So despite these logical pieces of evidence, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the agency, they keep pushing war on the president. And, again, if they get war, that's 60,000 ground troops. And that means, of course, 60,000 more customers, 
to sell heroin to. Well, how many people do you think in the CIA were, were actually involved in this whole um, scheme, I guess we'd say? It seems like essentially everyone there on the ground was involved in this in some way or another. I mean, you're talking about growing the, the drugs, harvesting them, then you have to change the, the opium to heroin that has to take place in different centers of conversion. And then you have men who would fly the drugs on Air America into places like into like, like, like Vietnam or Laos, or again, we talked about the United States. So there's all different types of those that have different parts uh, in the equation that, that, they're, that they're taking part in. And they even hire in some cases uh, civilian um, contractors to help them with the process too. And unfortunately, there was one case that where a plane was shot down and two men died who were in, on, Air, on an Air America plane, uh, Charles Herrick and Joseph Cheney. Uh, they were shot down in September of 63. So this is um, kind of how it worked with Air America transporting most of the uh, operations. Hmm. And so where do you think the money led to? Like who was near the top of the pyramid there? Well, Ted Shackley was the one who got appointed by the agency to, to operate the drug trade in Laos. And this is under Johnson's administration. And then after that, once he gets to Southeast Asia, he sets up Operation Phoenix, which, again, I mentioned before, this keeps the drug trade going, keeps the war going. It gives Johnson and Nixon a high body count that they can give to the public. So the, it looks like they're winning the war. What they're really doing is just killing civilians, not really anti, not really killing communists. It just meant to give body counts to the public to justify that they're winning the war. And then um, Shackley also brings with him David Morales to help operate the drug trade in Pasch, which is in uh, northern Laos. So this is kind of how the nuts and bolts of it operate. And then I mentioned before that in '68 uh, they bring in Traficante. And the mafia becomes a uh, <clears throat> a key part of the equation to get the drugs into the United States. Did it make people like Johnson rich? Do you think? Well, <laughs> that would be interesting to look into, wouldn't it? I, I would imagine that he probably has a number of different areas where he could have taken uh, part in this and made himself quite wealthy. It's probably all been covered up, uh, but I would imagine, yeah, he probably did directly benefit from this in some way. Maybe yeah. he invested in defense contracts, and that would most likely be the way he would probably go. Wow. Yeah, it's too bad. It sure, it sure, uh, you know, I never really had any opinion about Johnson too much before I've been doing the interviews on this area. So now it's kind of, it's kind of surprising me in a way. I don't know why. And, you know, he does a number of good things. I mean, he does, he's not all bad. I mean, he does sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the, and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And, you know, he does try to end poverty in the country with his war on poverty and starts, you know, the Job Corps and Head Start Program, Medicare and Medicaid. These are all things that most of the public supports to this very day. So I mean, there are some good things there. Yeah, But, yeah. Uh, you know, got to balance it with the other. Uh, yeah, and the thing is, it's not just like... Um having an affair or something. This is a little bit more... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit more extreme. I s <laughs> but <laughs> I guess that depends on how you look at things, your point of view. But I don't know. So, <laughs> so is there anything else that people should know or anything else that stuck out that we didn't mention about, the, um, about your book here, about the uh, murders of these four great men? Well, one thing that... Um that kind of surprised me. I mean, it's not really about the murders themselves, but I'm just impressed by the courage of these four men, how they could change, how they could evolve, how they could be so interested in, and, and, and funny for people that were of a class in cases that they weren't even from. And just like with President Kennedy, I mean, he evolves quite a bit. He starts off as a strong Cold Warrior, you know, guns are blazing, wants to fight the Cold War, and he realizes that it's just not worth fighting. It's just not worth fighting Vietnam or Cuba or Laos. And even his marriage, he, he evolves. I mean, the summer of <clears throat> of 63, 
we, you might know that um, Jackie Kennedy gave birth to Patrick Kennedy, and this little boy died after, I think, two days in the hospital. And the death of this little boy just affected the president enormously. And he ended his affairs at that point in time. Uh, he became much closer to his wife. The, uh, the Secret Service noticed that they were holding hands in public quite a bit, and it just changed everything for him. He became a better husband and just a better man. And um, it just became kind of tragic in the sense that Jackie Kennedy said he, he, she just finally got her husband back, and then this had to happen. Yeah. And the last one in my book, I just put this little quote here that I just want to share with you. She wrote to her, um, her pastor, uh, Philip Hannon, who did JFK's eulogy. Uh, she wrote to him, um, if only I could believe that he could look down and see how he is missed and how no one will ever be the same without him. Hmm. Yeah, it kind of says it all, doesn't it? And I think it applies not just to him, but all four of those men. It just really kind of uh, affected so many people. You know, you know, I it just it came to mind. I I've been in in the research and stuff I've been doing. Do you have you seen that kind of docudrama called Parkland? Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, did you notice the time when? So after after when they're sitting in the uh, hospital waiting room after Kennedy's you know dead, kind of it's been announced, and they show the the Brinkley newscast mm-hmm. on the TV in the background, and how. So he's he's announced how you know you know Kennedy's dead and all that stuff, and how he goes. It would be kind of, I don't know what he said, tacky or uncouth to mention, but uh, we could talk about the things we have to look forward to now. Yeah. You know, like just it just felt that that it was so callous, yeah. and if you're not paying attention, you you don't catch it. But and I'm just thinking, what a what a what an awful thing to say the same time that he's like the same e- that evening that he gets killed yeah it's just so disrespectful to say that yeah because yeah. even, if, even if he wasn't I look at it different because I mean they, the people put him in and even if you didn't agree with him he was he's still an American and he was still put in as the leader and someone just just uh, killed him in front of everybody yeah it was a yeah. public execution and just so disrespectful to our nation's democracy to do any of these things. Yeah, because he was really, really representing the, the free world. Yeah, he was. He was a, a figurehead for that, and and to just kind of be so callous on the news. <laughs> I just, uh, I don't know. There's just things you catch later in your life that you didn't see when you were young. And uh, I just thought that was kind of a, a weird. A weird thing no, to say. It yeah. was absolutely, but inappropriate. It, it totally, totally. I, I, you know, I. But that's how I feel. But anyway. <laughs> no, I agree with you. That's how I feel too. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's just, just really. It, it's not the right thing. Like, I mean, if he. To say. Yeah. If he. Uh, yeah. If he didn't believe in his politics, that's fine. But uh, that's just an awful, awful thing to say at an awful time. You know. But that's in the past. So, okay, let's take a break and come back and get into your paranormal. Great. You can listen to us anytime, anywhere now. Download our free app now for the iPhone and iPad. Look for the Warren Exchange or House of Mystery app at the Apple App Store today. who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico. I'd say happier than the Pillsbury Doughboy on his way to a baking convention. Get happy. Get Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Okay, we're back. And now we're on the paranormal side. And uh, it's- Box is my website. Um, it's a company that I started three years ago. And the paranormalwalks.com, it, it goes through, there's a gallery section there where you, you can see where where we do the walks and you know, kind of how it goes and the routes are. And they're done in Hamburg, 
and Lockport. These are two suburbs of, of Buffalo. Okay. And we talk about the whole range of the paranormal, not just ghosts, but also conspiracy theories and, you know, uh, strange reports of UFOs and mysterious sea creatures, things like that, that all get kind of put into the, into the walk route. And there's been some, you know, really great stories that happen even during the walk themselves. And each site has a certain story that happens there. We talk about what happens in the site, and then, you know, we move on to the next one. And uh, we also bring ghost-busting equipment with us, like K2 meters and, and Gauss meters and motion detectors. So it's also um, interactive and instructional, too. Okay, so they learn uh, learn about the um, equipment and what goes on in a in kind of a, I guess they call it a ghost hunt. So, yeah, in fact, we are... Kind of, it, it, we deputize people. We kind of give. Um, a, usually, the kids get the get the equipment, so they feel kind of invested in the night, so they can become um, little ghostbusters for the evening. As a family-oriented uh, company, so you know, each group has like a like a Gauss meter or a K2 meter, and they take it with them throughout the night, and, and they report if they get any spikes on the, on the different meters. So it keeps it interactive and fun for the family. Well, sounds fun. And it's, so do you go to um, certain haunted locations? Yes. Um, each site is has a different paranormal event. Um, one cool site <clears throat> is in Lockport. Lockport is along the Erie Canal. It was an old Erie Canal town from the 1820s, so it's got a lot of great stories to it. And um, one site is there was a demonic possession case that happened there. And this, the first area where this was, before it was a demon possession case, it was a burial ground. So a lot of bodies were there that they moved. And then uh, people moved in over the years, different families moved in. But then this one group moved in, the Shack family moved in, and they felt that they were being attacked by some demons. They got scratched, and their, their house was um, targeted for a number of days. And then um, later on, it becomes the Department of Motor Vehicles in the 1900s, the DMV. Hmm. So now it's a government office. So it's really haunted now. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the demonic motor vehicles. <laughs> yeah. <I guess. laughs> so it's kind of one of many places. And it's kind of weird. Um, the family there, they had three girls. And one thing that happened to them is they were scratched. All three girls were scratched on the chest. And we had three girls on the tour that got scratched in the chest, too. And, you know, that happened a couple of years ago. So history repeated itself on one of the walks. Hmm. Wow. Um, so is it is it a pretty terrifying walk, or...? Well, it's not really terrifying. It's just that, you know, some of the stories can be, I guess, a little bit unusual. I mean, there is, again, it's all historically based. Some sites are, uh, you might have expected it could be haunted. The one in Hamburg is, is a gas station, in fact, the Noco gas station. And uh, the staff there says the ghost there is named Jeffrey. And they were talking about this on the walk, and one woman says, well, you know what, my cousin lived there, and it used to be a house, and his name was Jeffrey, and he died there. So I can confirm definitely that there was a man that lived on that site a number of years ago that, that died in the house. And the week after that, we had a police officer come on the walk, and he said, I know for a fact we took the body out of the house, and he died there. So this, the good things happen like this on the walk kind of confirms the stories from the staff. Hmm. Sounds really interesting, actually. So, how, how long do you run this every year? Or do you, is it all the time? or? Yeah, it runs um, in September and October. The, end of the, the, the spooky season, I guess you could say. Yeah. Uh, those two months. People tend to be more interested in the paranormal during those times for whatever reason, because of Halloween, obviously. Yeah. So you know, we run every uh, every Friday and Saturday. Uh, Hamburg goes on Friday, and Lockport's on Saturday. And we're going to have another walk this year in downtown Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo is undergoing a lot of uh, renovation in the downtown area, in the waterfront, so we're going to run a walk down, down in that area. And there's a lot of great stories down there. In the, it's called the Cobblestone District, and we're going to do one down there. Okay, wow. What got you into that? Well, I think one thing is the books that I've written. Um, and the website has a list of books. And I felt that one way to bring these stories to the public would be to do these walks. And it would be instructional and, and interactive. 
people can bring their cameras and they can take pictures and they put them up on the website. They ask questions, they answer questions. So I thought it would be a good way to just have some family fun and bring stories to the public and be interactive with them and, and kind of expand people's minds to the paranormal. Yeah. In fact, one cool thing in the walks is we actually see E. Howard Hood's house. He oh. is one of the parts of the story. He lived in Hamburg where he grew up. And he went to Hamburg High School and we talked about him being involved in the conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. He, he's also buried in Hamburg too. So that story comes up on, on the walk too, in the Hamburg walk. Wow. That's, uh, so, so you've written quite a few books on the paranormal then. Yes. Um, the last book I did before this one was The Conspiracy to Assassinate President McKinley. And um, that happened in Buffalo, you know, where I'm from, and talk about that in the book about McKinley assassination. That was my last book. And then before that, I did some books about a man named Father Nelson Baker and did a book about his miracles. So I tried to examine his miracle stories, not from the standpoint of faith, but the standpoint of trying to prove them through science and evidence. If we could prove miracles through, uh, you know, that kind of approach through, through history rather than faith. And those, those miracles from, from Baker, there are a number of them that you can't explain any other way but through the, that approach through science. Hmm. Really interesting. Um, okay. So what's your What's your point of view on paranormal stuff? Like you know, all the 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 kind of a hit lately. You know, all the TV shows and things going on. Uh, do you think it's just a, a fad, or do you think it's something that's progressing? I think that as we go forward in time, I think people will be much more open to it, hopefully. Um, I mean, from my perspective, some of the things that are called paranormal are really normal. They just are part of our everyday experiences. I mean, I think things like, as I said, conspiracy theories, I think are more common than we think. we we'll tend to work in groups. I mean, the, the things like aliens and vampires and ghosts, I mean, other societies view these things as just part of everyday living, everyday experiences. They're not even considered to be paranormal. They're just actually a normal part of living. So if we just change our point of view, I think we can be more open to these things as we go forward in time. Yeah, could be good. Okay, so one last time. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they do that? All right, there's paranormalwalks.com. The, that website um, has the contact section. Uh, you can contact me through that website, paranormalwalks.com. And um, you can also get my latest book. Again, it's uh, Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X. It's available on Amazon and also Barnes & Noble. Now, right now, it's out of stock, but they're going to order it more, so don't be afraid. Order it up. It's a good Christmas gift. Uh, again, it's just 100 pages. It's less than 10 bucks for the uh, Nook and Kindle download. I think it's worth the read. Um, again, please... Contact me if you want. Um, the email address is on the website. That's paranormal, <coughs> paranormal uh, walks at gmail dot com. If you want to send me an email, I'd love to answer any questions anybody has. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for joining. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Good pleasure. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. <laughs>